So for those of you out there wondering what exactly we're going to, we're going to be talking about, uh, the, a few weeks ago, as, as we record this, Mark and I did, or mostly Mark, <laughs> did a discussion with my men's team on looking at other teams playing either through video or watching them live and using what they could see to develop an understanding of how the players that they're matched up play, uh, how, what their team, how their team plays together. So my thought was for this, we could do something similar to that, but more from a coaching perspective in terms of how can coaches watching matches, any match, does it, we're not even talking about watching teams that you're scouting. This is more of a kind of general coaching education thing just to get better. Um, how can coaches use watching other teams play to better themselves, increase their, their coaching IQ, so to speak? Uh, so, and Mark watches lots and lots and lots of video, even when he doesn't have to. Uh, did you, you've still got, what, what happened with your YouTube? Uh, what happened with my YouTube was that it what the account was officially suspended um, with no information and no recourse. Um, so I did some research and uh, for copyright infringements, they normally give you a, a notice. Mm -hmm. So even though I was running a, a risk of uh, IOC taking stuff down, which they had before, um, I just, I, I had made the assumption that they would, as they had previously, give notice and just say this is not allowed or whatever. Right. Um, and, but, you know, I, I, they didn't say what it was for. They didn't say it was for copyright infringement. They said it was for, um, I forget what it Violation was. Violation of terms and services or something general along exactly. those lines. Yeah. Exactly. So, so and you had a ton of tons and tons of videos that you would come across and uh, sort of yeah, I was up to like 150 videos of different okay. sorts at the time that it went down. You're rebuilding that now, sort of. Uh, I won't. I probably won't put up the match. Put the matches back up again because that was a fair bit of that was a fair bit of work and plus. Well, I've been putting matches up for six or seven years, so right, it wasn't yeah. something that I did over the weekend that I can mm -hmm. do over another weekend. So, okay, um, one by one, I'll put up. I'll probably put up all of the the highlight ones and the ones that are embedded in my in blog posts. Okay, um, I'll, I'll likely put those ones back up and and leave the rest of it. So, okay. the the actual thing that bugs me the most because I still have all of those videos. So I, 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 in a sense, don't lose anything except the time that I right. invested in it. But the one thing that actually bugs me is that I had um, some fairly well-curated playlists okay. that were included, that didn't only include my videos, they were all the videos on that I had found on YouTube for each of the tournaments so um so yeah that's the that's the big loss for me that's the thing that, that's the thing that's been lost so yeah. even if you lose, lose a bunch of my videos all of that other stuff is well some of it it's is still there yeah it's still there somewhere now you just got to go find it one by one well except the ones that i have taken down <laughs> yeah i mean there uh, was there was because tv was playing old matches Mm -hmm. in uh during lockdown period um brazilian tv for example was playing lots of old olympics matches and somebody was posting them straight away gotcha. and they were they were high quality olympic games and i can't imagine they're still there right yeah yeah that's what happens they don't nobody notices when it's just one person in their office posting a video from now from time to time but if somebody starts abusing the system dramatically, then that tends to be a sweeping reaction. I, I think that um, I understand the, that IOC want to maintain their, their rights to yep. earn money from those events, and that's, that's fine. Um, but 
those games are not available on IOC platforms. So right. if yeah. IOC platform had all of those games available, I would be more than happy to say I would pay my 10 bucks and watch those games, mm -hmm. but yeah. they're not there. So, right. And that's all <laughs> just people. that can, that can come up in, in a discussion of the business of volleyball or the lack of business in volleyball, um, depending on your perspective on it. Anyway, but the whole point is you've watched a lot of video, you've curated a lot of video, you use it on your website to make points about players should or should not be playing certain balls, <laughs> things like that. Um, and one of the early blog posts that I posted was the value to coaches of, of just going and watching a lot of, a lot of matches from an analytic perspective. You know, it's one thing to watch it as a fan, but it's a whole different thing if you're watching it from a coaching point of view to try to understand what's going on. And that's where the, that's the value where it comes in. And that's the sort of stuff we want to talk about here. Uh, yes. It's also, it's also one of my coaching tips. Um, I think it's something like tip 58. I don't want to be quoted on that, but watching matches is, is definitely one of the important tools that a coach has in uh, improving their skills and understanding of the game. Let me, before we really get going, uh, let me ask you this sort of, I guess, I don't know, tongue in cheek or whatever. Can you watch a match as a fan anymore? Or are you always in analytic mode? Uh, well, that, that's actually maybe a good place to start because um, if I'm watching, I, if I'm watching as a fan, if I want to watch as a fan, which I like to do, then uh, the best place to, to watch the game as a fan is in the fan areas, uh, which means, well, I, I don't mean with fans, but I mean in the but place that... In the, that in the fans, fans where fans on, normally see, right, yeah. Which is, uh, which is normally on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. somewhere on the sidelines. And I find that... Um, is a much that's a much better view to to enjoy the spectacle of the game if i sit behind the court then i'm watching it as a uh, as a coach um because that's the that's the coach's view which is not incidentally the best view it's the coach's view right um if i want to uh see the game but also enjoy it, then the place I actually like to sit the most is is uh, on a baseline corner, basically. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, the, so split, split the difference. Yeah, exactly. I find the the view from the end of the court, I find to be an almost two-dimensional view of the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the one from the sideline, the one from the, the yeah, sidelines, the sort of along the net, you can see the dynamics of the game, but you don't get different parts of the, uh, you get yeah. the height, for example, like yeah. from the end, the back of the court, you don't get the height and power mm -hmm. from the sideline. You get the height and power, but not some of the movement and the, uh, the back corner is pretty good. Yeah. Both the, the end line and the sideline lack a certain depth to them. Whereas the corner lets you get a little bit more, as you say, more three-dimensional. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, at this point, I can watch from the end. I can watch from the the back of the court and understand most of the time how the ball is sort of um, depth-wise from the net by the reactions mm -hmm. of the players. Um, but it's a it's a piecing together of it rather than a than a seeing than a seeing it exactly. Yeah. And, and related to that, and this, and this is something that, that certainly college coaches can appreciate, is we obviously see a lot of video from recruits. Right. And most, and it comes in all different varieties, depending on who's doing the, the, the videoing. If it's just some random parent who doesn't really know any better and is just recording on their phone, it's usually from a, like I said, it's from a fan perspective. So it's right. somewhere near the net on the sideline, maybe eight rows up, you know, or higher in, in the seats. Uh, and, 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 you know, <laughs> and of course they're doing vertical 
vertical video. So we lose all perspective on what's going on around their kid. So yeah. <laughs> doing a lot of stuff. Um, but a lot of it these days, because people have gotten a little more sophisticated and they're using things like huddle with the high school team. So they put the camera off the back and, and record yeah. it like you would record a match. From, so, mm -hmm. and to your point, you see, so you can see things like movement around the court quite well that way. Yes. You can see um, where the setter is getting the ball to relative to the to the pins, mm -hmm. but you can't see how far off the net that really is. You kind of have to where does the player yeah. jump and um, so. He, he, <laughs> But obviously, if you got the cameras on the side view, then you can start to see, well, is she setting the ball, you know, a meter off the net or two meters yeah. off the net? And, you know, all right, I like that. Can I make an adjustment off of that? Um, and it's the same thing, you know, if you're actually in the gym working with the players and want to do replay or something with them, you know, as you know, as you've, I think, basically done more or less everywhere you've gone these last few years anyway. Every time, every time it's been possible. Yeah. You know, where you put the camera kind of dictates what exactly you can look at yeah anyway um okay so we talked about where to sit <laughs> or at least the camera angle or whatever we like uh what's kind of the starting point of of what you would suggest people look at uh <laughs> so the uh the first the first point is if you want to, if you're watching the game to understand the game, the the most important skill is not to watch the ball. Mm -hmm. So that's um, uh, something that took me 20 years to figure out, um, and it took me then another three years after that to get reasonably good at it, um, and it's it's a weird thing that I think should be on the first page of, it should be the first page of every coaching manual. It's one of those ones that, that in the, once you figure it out, it's so obvious that you're scared to say something about it out loud because <laughs> it must be on the first page of the coaching book that you didn't bother reading because you thought that that was the easy stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> um, that and uh, when you're talking to somebody to say their name at the beginning of the sentence instead of the end of the sentence. Like those two things are fundamental coaches' skills that should be, they, they should be right at the, the top of the page of any, uh, any coaching book. And, and both of them are yeah, nowhere to be found in, yeah. and in my coaching level. tips. <laughs> Sorry? So then you won't find them in any coaching manual. Well, it, the the one with the names was one where I, I like I really quietly asked a couple of um, like phys ed sort of backgrounds mm -hmm. yeah. people, and and they looked at me like I didn't know what. Well, that, that's that's exaggerating a little bit, but it wasn't something that's taught somewhere. Yeah, but it's both of those things. Like once you once you work it out, they um, and maybe good coaches work it out. Maybe it's actually the difference between good coaches and bad coaches is they work it out for themselves. But, sure. Yeah. But anyway, the, the first thing is, uh, is to not watch the ball, which is really difficult to do because um, it's, it's, as a coach, it's the thing that you tell people to do, to watch and where to look. But um, that's what you, you have to ignore. The ball, as you talk, tell blockers, the ball has no information after it's after the contact, mm -hmm. before the next contact. So we can ignore it, and we should learn to ignore it. And in fact, one of the uh, one of the kind of the analogies that I that I've I come up with is the uh, the magic eye pictures that uh, used to that were really popular for a time in the 90s, I think mean, 80s. The, the, um, the three-dimensional pictures where you see colors and sh shapes, but you, you inside the, this picture is a... Um, Some sort of uh, image, is, right? Is a three-dimensional image. Mm -hmm. If you watch more rats, it's a big uh, part of the more rats... Uh, 
um, storyline. Right. But <laughs> Ethan, Ethan Supley stands in, in front of his picture for the whole movie, trying to figure out, trying to see the sailboat that's inside the, that's inside the picture. There we go. Everybody but go watch you, small rats. <laughs> but when you, when, when you look at it, the, to see the picture, the first thing you have to do is, is focus on a point and then you can see the picture. But once you've unlocked it in a sense, you can move around and see different parts of it. Like you can move your head. Once it's there, you can move your head around and see all the different parts of it. Like uh, actually the, uh, like at a cinema, like if, when you're in a really big screen cinema, you can look at, like you can actively move your head and look at different parts of the screen. Sure. And the point is that, <laughs> to get back to it is, that once you've got the hang of not looking at the ball, you can actually move your head around and see the movements of the players. Um, if you're on the sideline, maybe you can only see on one side of the court, but if you're at the end line, you can see how the players are moving from, uh, from both, on both sides of the court. And that's, uh, uh, that's a really key thing for, for understanding the game is seeing how the players are moving before and after the ball. And um, when you can do that, if you can manage to do that, then that unlocks some, uh, some things that you never expected to see. Yeah. Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's a learned skill. I mean, it, it is definitely a learned skill. Uh, and it's, and to, to your point about coaches don't seem to think about it very much. We, hopefully, or, you know, when we're talking, like you said, with the blockers about what are you looking at? What should you be looking at? And I remember having a conversation with my team at Exeter. You know, what are you watching on the other side? Uh, just watching the ball. And you're like, oh, okay, that's not good. <laughs> we need to fix that. Yeah. But then we go right back to it and like, well, we're just watching the ball all the time. That's We, we do the same thing. <laughs> exactly. I, and I can remember – it's maybe maybe it's 15 years ago now. The first time it crossed my mind that should actually should I be watching the players instead of the ball? And I was an assistant at that time, and so I watched the head coach a few times in practice, and I saw him watching the ball, and I said, "Okay, he's a he's a more experienced coach than me, so that must be the um, that must be it." Right. So then I put it on the back in the drawer for another few years before I started to, to revisit it. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's kind of like meditation in that you can start, you can start it and you go and you focus on the player that you're trying to focus on or the part of the court you're trying to focus on. And then the ball will catch your attention. And you'll find yourself watching the ball again. Oh, oh, oh I need to, I need to refocus on, you know, whatever my meditation point is or my mantra or, or something. Yeah. Uh, and it, yeah, you get a training. You have to practice it. There's, there's no way around it. You just have to intentionally practice it to make sure you can get good at it. Now, which is kind of why I brought up the point of, do you watch it as a, as a coach or do you watch it as a fan? Because the fans watching the ball. I mean, let's, let's be honest. And that's kind of what you do as a fan. That's kind of the whole yeah. point. Uh, that's actually a good point because now, even whatever position I'm sitting at, I'm still, I, I'm still disengaging from the ball to watch what people uh, are, are doing and even on even tv games so i'm i've got to the mm -hmm. point where even on the little even on the little screen if i'm watching a game on my computer screen yep. i can disengage from the ball and um you know and look for the players so there's yep. even there's even a, a particular point after the set where i go away from the the ball mm -hmm. and and look for where the defenders are right yeah and it's one of the reasons i wrote a, a blog post not too long ago about the stuff that, that i don't like seeing in recruiting videos and and one of the things that i, that I bring up with with libros especially but anybody in a receiving or a defense role where they're putting highlights of i made this great dig or i made this perfect pass or whatever first problem being I don't know if those are the only 10 good ones you had the whole year. And then otherwise you're Shankopotamus. I don't know that. But second off, I can't see how you move when the ball is not coming to you or even when it is coming to you. 
and yes. how you, you're interacting with the rest of the play. And I need to see that from a defender, from a receiver. If you're a hitter and you go up and thump a few balls, all right, I got a pretty good idea what level you, you at least are capable of achieving. Yeah. But if, if all I do is I stand and watch a ball that gets served directly at you, get past perfectly a target, I haven't really learned a heck of a lot. Well, that could be giving invaluable information. If they're always exactly where the serve goes, that means they're a pretty good receiver. Yeah, if I had if I had a lot more than ten reps, <laughs> then I might be able to draw that conclusion. <laughs> in in the defense in the defense example specifically, that's one of that's one of those things that the most spectacular plays are um, very often the ones where the player is in a bad position to begin yeah. with, right. and they're saving some action. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I remember, I remember exactly the first day that I understood about um, movement in defence was when I was still a player and I was exactly 23, 22, 22. And there was a player in the national team where I, that I was playing with who had a reputation as a great defender. And he moved, he was always moving in defense, like he was always moving in relation to the ball and the set. Mm -hmm. And he he was diving every time and he touched every single ball, but he never defended. He never defended a single ball. So all of that movement mostly took him away from where he, where he was supposed to be in the first mm -hmm. place. And the dive was a frantic recovery to get yeah. the ball that would have hit him on the leg if he'd actually been just standing there looking at someone in the crowd. Right. And this comes up when, when you're watching, like last year, two years ago, Stanford has a, a faint or had, she's, she's graduated now. Morgan Hentz was their libero who everybody talked about in absolutely glowing terms. And I'm not about to, to diss her. But when I'm, the, the, exactly. one of the yeah. now one of the thoughts that was going through my head, you know, is oh she makes all these spectacular plays and all that. I'm like, it'd be really interesting to to just break her down and analyze her, and see if she's having to make a lot of spectacular plays because she's not positioning herself properly, or if she's just capable of reacting a little bit more quickly than other players and getting balls that other players can't get to otherwise. And that's not something you can necessarily just just watching a random college match on TV pick up. Yeah, the the male example of that is uh, is Yenia Grabenikov, the French libero, mm -hmm. who covers a lot of ground and makes a lot of spectacular plays. But I'm never a hundred percent sure if he would get just as many or more if he covered less area. Let's put it let's put it like that. So, if, right. he, if he if he was more stable, if he was more stable, I think that he would um, that he would control better some balls. But whether the question is, of course, whether he gets more balls up and on balance, whatever the balance is. So, just just for the listeners' enjoyment, back in was it twenty? 15 or 2016 when, when you were at Berlin and you're playing Friedrich Hoffman in the finals. Um, yes. There was a, there was a match that I got to watch in which basically the rule of thumb was if Grabenikov passed the ball, Friedrich Hoffman got the side out. If anybody else passed the ball, they mm -hmm. almost didn't get the side out most of the time. It was, it was so stark in that particular match. It's just like, why yeah. would you ever serve a ball to this guy? And it didn't even have to. It didn't even have to be that he passed the ball perfectly. But he, if he got the ball, the first contact, that was it. They got the point. Well, as you know, that there are if there are structurally a lot of advantages in the libero mm -hmm. um, taking the first ball. Yep, exactly. Which which circles back to the blog post that you mentioned in the beginning about <laughs> how structure breaks down when just anybody takes a ball. Mm -hmm. All right, so we've got where you sit, and we've got watch the ball, not watching the ball, learning, training yourself to not watch the ball. Okay, what's our yeah. next? What's our next point of focus? Well, we, if we're not watching the ball, we're watching the the movements, the movements of the players. So, 
we we can continue the the basic i the basic idea and that uh, you want to get further away from the ball. So um, the setter, for example, has maybe should be the, the least of your concerns if you're sort of watching, watching the whole, trying to watch the whole game so that you switch your focus pretty early onto the blockers. So what, where, what are the blockers' starting positions, how they're reacting to... Um, how they're reacting to the position of the reception, to the approach patterns of the spikers. The spikers, you can, if you can see the ball, because in this whole scenario, you can still see the ball. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's, it's, it's in your periphery enough. somewhere, yeah. It's in your periphery. And for example, if you're doing it on TV, if you're doing, sorry, on the laptop or even a TV, then, you know, everything is pretty close together anyway. Mm -hmm. So if you can see the ball, you can also see pretty well the attack, um, the appro attack sorry, approaches. So really the, what you're looking at the most closely is, the, is the, the blockers, the starting position of the blockers, how they react to, um, uh, to the, the reception, the origin of the set, the um, approaches of the spikers. And then the defenders, how they how they react after the after the set, and uh, what happens after that is is some pretty amazing things are revealed. Yeah, well, and it's it, we've we've talked before, and you've mentioned this on a few occasions, and Sketch mentioned this the other uh, in in my discussion with him about how at a certain level of play, especially in the men's game, things are pretty consistent. You've said, what, 80, 85% of what you pull up in a scouting report for any given team is going to be about the same from team to team. Um, one of the things that's interesting, I had, um, I had learned, Lauren Bertolacci talked to my women's team from yeah. the same, same sort of talk that you had with the men's team. Yeah. And she, she was talking with them about the gap go play or the shoot go play or whatever your terminology is for the 31 and then the second tempo to the outside hitter. And I, you know, in, in going through and trying to find some footage for my players to see examples of this and what the, the overload concept that Lauren was trying to, to share with them, I, I got an example from USA versus Brazil on the women's side. And you could, you can make note of what Brazil was doing in in a transition situation in their block against that play, which they know is coming, mm -hmm. versus what they're doing in, a, in the, the receive phase of play for USA yeah. and how this blocker is releasing or not releasing, where's the middle positioning themselves vis-a-vis -vis the other middle uh, and all that sort of stuff, which you know is exactly the sorts of things that you're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the... That's the, the main thing, the main thing really. And what the more that I watch in that with that methodology, if you want to call it a methodology, then the more you see, um, and this is how I know coaches are watching the ball because this is actually an explanation of what what I what I am seeing is that players have automatic reactions to the position of the ball. Mm -hmm. um, so they respond, whatever the tactic is, they respond. Uh, there's something about the way that most players, I want to say, I was going to say humans, but I think, I actually think that it's something about the way they understand the geometry of the court that they will automatically react to the ball in certain ways that are um, that are negative. And the obvious one is the the most obvious one that I that I talked a lot about is when the setter moves backwards, the reception is close to the net, but the setter moves backwards, the blocker in position four always maintains their position in relation to the setter. So they would 
move toward the so antenna along with the, the setter. setter. The setter, and this is position four. Mm -hmm. Then the setter moves back. Position four will move back. Right. And then the second thing that happens is that the middle blocker, he he also wants to move in that direction, and because there's a space, he will move into the empty space that he can that he can fuel. And so what you what you have there is a positive situation, um, an overload situation for the setter. Right. It means yeah. the the middle blocker never goes all the way. Position four blocker is always behind, so the close quick has a seam. Mm -hmm. The pipe is open because the middle blocker has moved away from the centre of the court. Sure. And the long ball to position four is guaranteed one on one. One on one, yeah. And exactly. that's all because position four reacts automatically to the movement of the ball. And meanwhile, the most common thing well, we could we could obviously look at the numbers based on level, but for probably sub professional level players, the most common tendency is probably to set closer to, to position one or to position two when the center is backing up that way, because that's the comfortable set for them. Uh, it can be, can be. Yeah. But then, but that doesn't change the, whatever the level that now the first tempo is still open where he wasn't, where they weren't open before. Right, right. So. Yeah, as long as the, the, the center, well, as long as your middle makes that run, and as long as your center thinks something other than just put up a high ball. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. That's, yeah. That's a that's a train. There are automatic tenden there are automatic tendencies of the of setters as well. Mm -hmm. So yep. So okay. And coaches who, who tell them to automatically play long, for example. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've definitely seen that. Um, not a lot when you when you're in the lower levels because you know, the kids either don't think they can push the ball that far or they they just don't have the the footwork developed yet to be able to do it. Um, but it, that's a side point. One of one of the interesting aspects of, of doing an analysis like this, watching other teams play, is the things that you can pick up about systems and how they're supposed to work in theory, like what you're taught is the reason for doing certain yes. things. And this came up in the discussion with, yes. with Lauren, is a lot of teams these days bunch their blockers. Yes. Presumably to have the, the wings help out on a quick attack with the middles and 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 it, oftentimes it doesn't happen at all. <laughs> so right. the, the the underpinning theory says do this, but if you watch enough volleyball, you'll notice yeah the position four player is never helping out with the quick. So you can learn from those sorts of things in terms of taking reality and coaching to reality instead of coaching to what the textbook says. Yeah, and you're laughing because I know this is a a, a point for you. Uh this has nothing to do with the topic, but the if, if you actually watch the game, the things that happen in the game are not what you expect. And they're actually, I've, I'm going to, I'll go out on a limb and say to a large degree, they're not even what the participants think they're doing. <laughs> yeah, I can go so on. I, that. I, so spiking, for example, I don't think that I uh, I don't I'm I'm 100% convinced that spikers don't spike in men's volleyball they don't spike the way that you think they spike. Okay, well, for people who haven't watched nearly as, as much men's volleyball as you have, explain what that what you mean by that. Well, the way that you teach the way that spikers are taught to spike is to see the block and to spike around the block. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that women's volleyball is probably more in that direction. Is, than is, and than which is yeah. why the Libero def ends up defending so many balls in women's volleyball. Mm -hmm. Because there's a double block and the spiker sees the block and spikes past the past right. the block and the Libero camps past the block. And there's uh, some other things, but I, that's what I suspect happens there. With men's volleyball, um, they a lot, lot of the time they are, they 
choose or they predetermine their attack bef uh, before and at varying times before the attack. Mm -hmm. So opposites can predetermine their, their attack, especially from back row, from position one. They, um, they will predetermine their general attack direction before the setter contacts the ball. Yeah. And they, and that's, that's one thing. Um, a lot of the time players are not spiking at the court. So in men's volleyball, they're not even thinking about the court. So we, we chart, we spend hours charting with a piece of paper. We, maybe we don't do it exactly anymore, but we have a piece of paper and we draw lines on the piece of paper at the directions. But the reality is that the spikers are not spiking at parts of the court. They're spiking at parts of the block or parts or where they expect the block to be, which yeah. is a, which is a different thing again. So um, have a, I've had a conversation or I didn't personally, but my assistant had a conversation with a, with a player who, uh, who said they like playing at home better than away because at, when they played at home, they knew the point of the advertising to aim for that the block would end up um, end up getting into, so that they would the block would touch it on the way out. See, you bringing that up is is actually really interesting because I've been doing research on on home advantage of volleyball, which is generally speaking, from the research I've seen on other sports, it's it's about the smallest of the sports. Rugby, okay. a, a Spanish group did I think ten different sports in rugby was like way on way on, on the top. It was like 67% of the time the home team won. Whereas in volleyball, it was like 55, 56%. And the numbers that I've run backs that up across different leagues, different countries, all that, it's pretty, it's pretty much on that end. And uh, yeah. for me, part of, part of the reason is that because we're playing multiple sets as opposed to one one time period of a game, like a rugby mm -hmm. match would be, or basketball or, or soccer or anything, the better team is going to tend to win in that sort of structure, just generally speaking. But there is still some advantage. You know, you can statistically show there is still some home advantage. And there's always these theories about, well, why is that? And one researcher I talked to recently expressed the view that, at least in part, it's the subjective nature of the officials making calls you know, like in, in, in soccer, because that was his, his specialty, you know, whether it's a tackle or whether it's a foul or not a foul, a penalty, not a penalty. Things that in that sport tend to be quite influential, because if you call a penalty, that's, they only score a small number of points in a game. And if you call a penalty, that's going to represent a large portion. Yeah. In volleyball, there's way more points and there are way fewer influential subjective calls. I think uh, I ran some numbers on NCAA stuff and it was like, 3% of points are, are, are the result of ball handling errors, which is really the only subjective, like truly subjective aspect of the game. Uh, now you can, you can, touched in. That, that was the other thing. Technically, that's not subjective. That's objective. But at the speed of it, – it is, it is subject to influence. I would, I would agree with you on that. But now well, you're bringing yeah. it up, well, okay, if you're at home and you've got a hitter who can target a certain spot on his court, but he can't do it, on another court, that's another area where home advantage can come in. Um, and now having just gone on that digression, I forgot what I was going to be, what I wanted to bring up. Um, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, to the point about, I agree with you on, on women not attacking the block nearly as frequently as, as the men do, especially Which if they, they should because the block in women's volleyball is worse. Yes. Yes. Um, the, the other thing I was going to say is I've, I'm going to agree with, with you in terms of attackers predetermining where they're going to go when that happens, obviously what happens with a set influences things at, in, in the end yeah. result, but when that predetermination happens probably varies a little bit based on level of play, like a high school kid might decide before the play even starts that they're going to hit the ball cross court and that's just going to be it. Whereas a you know a higher level player will just will determine a little bit later 
you know, maybe after the ball's actually been served, <laughs> they're going to they're gonna attack the ball line in this situation or in a certain body position. Uh, better, better players, they, they reduce their options earlier. That I'm, that I'm 100% sure of. So the, the junior kid who gets told to, that he has to be able to hit in every direction mm. is going up there thinking that I, I'm ready to hit in every direction. But good spikers, but the best spikers can hit in every direction, but they can't hit in every direction off one single ball. Right. So they don't wait for the ball. They, they can't hit from line to three meter line cross court off every single set. Mm -hmm. And they don't try. So they have two or three variations of the ball is here and here and here. And that's what they they work with, and they work with the with the block, right? And sometimes yeah. they can they can predetermine. Uh, really, the opposite from position one is is a really big one, and you can you can see it a lot with a lot of guys that if because the, the basic tactic for men's volleyball is that when the setter is back row. Oh, sorry, when the setter is front row, position four will stay close to the setter wherever he goes mm -hmm. because they don't set so much to position one. The theory goes, it's not true. Um, and the ball is a little bit slower, which it is because it's, it's off the net. Right. So when position four stays close to the setter, the opposite will hit line because he knows that this, the position four can't close the line no matter what right. he does. Right, and you, you will see there are some really good blockers who actually will dive to the line and get blocks because you know they they cover five meters of the court. So position four blockers, they can do some amazing amazing stuff, and they're in a sense they're predetermining their action as well. Right, and, and that's and and that situation is one of those ones where what I was talking about before about. The, the wing blocker pinching in and are they actually doing what they're nominally pinched in to do? Are they actually effectively defending against the center being able to attack a ball? Or are they actually helping out with the quick blocking the, the quick attack? Now at a certain level, yes, but where, where does that come into play? And I mean, honestly, most of the time where I've seen a, a left a, a, a position four blocker assigned to try to take away the attack of the center, they're they're not effective. <laughs> they're not doing it either because they're not they're not anticipating it, or they just they just don't get up on time. Yeah, but how many setters actually tip enough that you would dedicate a blocker to it? Oh, right. I, I, if there's no back row attack, I, I guess so. Well, but even then, it's it's still you you still ask the same question. You know, that's one of those things. Well, if there's no position one attacker or there's no position two attacker then pull the block over and they're going to cover the center well what if the center is is i mean how often even even if you have a good attacking center how often do they actually attack the ball yeah it might be six percent of the time yeah and that's on a on passes of, the, of sufficient quality but that's a that's a general tendency of blockers is to is to hedge yeah Block, blockers hate to ha, hate to predetermine their actions. They're the opposite. So they can sometimes jump with the first tempo, but the rest of the time they're they're hedging. They don't want to go too early, even on high balls. And one of the one of the things when I'm watching, not the ball but the blockers, is how terrible people are at blocking high balls how late they move, how badly positioned they are, how much they move their hands. And I know that men's volleyballers, men's volleyballers focus on, uh, on triple blocking mm -hmm. and they're horrendous at it. Yeah. Unless, of course, my definition of quality triple block is different from everybody else's, <laughs> which is also possible. Well, and, that, and that, one of the things I had thought of while you were saying that is, is that the reason why you don't actually see a lot of true commit blocking in the men's game? You might have positional commitment, 
but do the jump do the blockers actually jump in anticipation of the set for, in, in terms of a quick attack um really good ones do really good ones and really bad ones <laughs> so um the really good ones are prepared to are prepared to take the risk so but below the really best level they're still hedging so with the australian guys uh i they they could never commit properly they even when they committed they were always they were always late so even on the commit they were hedging right but uh, and on high balls and fast balls they 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 do it too yeah. really bad blockers will commit because um they convince themselves that they're doing something so it's a uh, i'm committing so i'm at least i'm stopping the i'm stopping the middle okay all right we're we're running close on time so just to we're run, running far from the topic close yeah. on time and far from the topic right. <laughs> hey, it's all good that's why we call them conversations um because it gives us a bit of freedom so just recap so the first thing we said is pick your um, pick your pick eight, your place you yeah where you said pick where you put it. second thing we said was mm -hmm. don't focus on the ball focus on something else whatever it happens to be movement of the players is generally speaking yeah. and third thing mm -hmm. is pay attention to the movement of the blockers and the defenders once yeah. the ball is in play anything we've missed any, any other points that you toss out there um couple of extra points that I'll make about the way you sit is to act is to sit in different points is to actually actively go to different places to watch the game mm -hmm. um, because from different places you see different things yeah. and um, I I had a big uh, I, I guess I, I don't want to say um, the word that I can't think of right now so I can't say it um, no, no, no. Okay. Uh, well, that would be a great moment. Oh, okay, gotcha. Uh, one time where by accident I was sitting along the net, and sitting along the net, you can see the the the, the position of the blockers' hands, how they penetrate, or in this case, yeah. not penetrate. Right. So, um, don't get stuck in one position. And this is actually a general coaching thing too, is um, coaches want to get to that end place, but you don't watch a match from that position. You actually have to watch the match from close to the court on the side, on, on the near the three meter line, some, yeah. somewhere along there. So you actually should in, pra in your practice, practice uh, watching the match from that position because that's the one that you, you have to, uh, uh, you have to use yeah. so that's one thing um, when in the second one about watching uh, not the ball is that uh, you can choose to watch whatever you want so you can choose to for five minutes that you only watch the setter so I'm, I, I said that you don't have to watch the setter because the setter has no information that's true in one sense so I want. I watch the block and the and the defence, but um, you can also choose to watch the setter because the setter does a lot of things. You can watch the how they move their body. When you watch setters really closely, they have really good setters have a lot of um, fairly subtle general movement, fairly subtle movements that are hard to pick up pick up if you're just watching broadly. But all of them uh, make the can make the blocker hesitate. So that's a, it's actually really fun to watch the setter really really closely. So um, those are the two things. And what was the third? The third point was about focusing on the there. block, the block and defense. Okay, so combination so, yeah. of third. There you go. All right. Yeah, we can we can wrap it up there.